Good afternoon. If I can have everybody's attention, please be seated. And those in the back, please move forward. I ask that you test any, text any questions that you would have to, and direct to the panel to the address shown on the screen. As a courtesy to our panel members, we ask that you silence all communications devices at this time. Welcome to the U.S. Indo-PACOM CIO panel titled Advancing Coalition C4 Resiliency. Today's moderator is Mr. Randy C. Slack, the U.S. Indo-PACOM CIO. Sir, over to you. All right. Uh, aloha and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for aloha. <laughs> Thanks for, uh, for coming. And uh, I was asked to, to uh, do a panel, and uh, I decided to do it on something that, that I find particularly challenging. As, uh, well, of course, uh, as Admiral Davidson said, you know, everything we do relies on our interoperability and sharing information with allies and partners. We have a more powerful force when we can combine our, our allies and partners and be able to command and control and form a unified force. That means we need to have an information system or a command and control computers and communication system that includes allies and partners and enables us to share information and, uh, and collaboration and decision support. Of course, it's, it hasn't been very easy. In, in the past, uh, we have created independent networks like uh, Combined Enterprise Information, Regional Information Exchange System, Centrixis. We have about 22 flavors uh, maybe, maybe even more than that. And in the Pacific, we have one for sharing with Korea, one with sh sharing with Japan, for Five Eyes, for Cooperative Maritime Forces Pacific, et cetera. And we just can't uh, afford to create independent networks for every information sharing uh, community that we need. So um, the model, the approach that, that that we're using is, is first consider the community itself, the allies and partners. And that's, that would be the community of interest of personnel that we want to share information with, personnel, forces, as well as, as, uh, as devices. And then on the other end is the information itself, the content. Uh, the content is, is protected or, or guarded, if you will, by policies, foreign disclosure policy, sensitivity policies. And, and those policies, as Admiral Davidson pointed out, oftentimes uh, just restrict our ability to share information. So oftentimes we'll have a, a strategic, national strategic imperative to share information, but at the same time we'll have a policy that says you can't share information, and oftentimes we get into this null set where, where you either have to take a heroic action or some risk or, or don't, don't uh, you know, ask for permission instead of... Uh, ask for forgiveness instead of permission type of implementation of information system. So, so you have the community of, of, of interest of folks, the coalition partners we want to share with. We have the information content and the policies. So in the middle is the technology, the, cyber, the, the cyberspace, the command and control technology that has to join together the, the information content with the users in such a way that not every community can be trusted with the same information. So how do you create an information environment that, that is able to respond to the policy and able to get our, our information and decisions shared with, with allies and partners? So given that, there's scopes of, of networks, scopes of information systems. The strategic scope is at a national level, enterprise level, where you have a federation, uh, if you will, or of of networks where you share information across gateways and policies. You go down to the operational level where you could form, uh, create collaboration communities to share information so that across nations you have the same information that you're all looking at to make common decisions. And then at the tactical level, you're getting information down to the soldier, airman, sailor, who really all they care about, all they need to know about is their tactical information. So we need to be able to filter and, and provide that information to that tactical user without distracting him with a bunch of uh, needless uh, information or information that would, dis would, would not serve as, as, uh, as usefulness. And also, uh, the other aspect going into this is to be able to progress and use software development in order to give ourselves great decision support tools. Currently, in our, a lot of our cybersecurity practices and information assurance, we have policies and controls that lock in old technology, and uh, we have to go through and do certifications, accreditations, and testings and inspections of, of information systems and policies that, that really are, are 
then therefore unable to move forward with the greatest um, technology that we have. The cloud has come into play and, and uh, instead of having client server type of, of systems, we basically have containerized or what I call podularized software that can be moved, distributed anywhere in the cloud and in our tactical infrastructure be able to distribute it down to the end where you don't have robust network connectivity. That's a very interesting problem. The other issue that, that we face is that in our current perimeter-based technology, in our client server, the red team almost always wins. And so commercial industry has, has introduced this concept of zero trust, where you don't trust the network, you just trust uh, the endpoints and the users, but you have to set up an infrastructure to make that work. So that's a lot of stuff to put together. You know, how do you, how do you continue development and progression how do you protect it against adversaries in a very fine-grained approach? And how do you do that across coalition, uh, across different nations? Pretty, pretty simple problem. That's why we've selected our panelists here. So they're going to help us uh, select a solution and, uh, and move from there. And then looking forward to your inputs as well. So I'd just like to introduce my panel. And uh, basically, I've looked for identity, identity experts, permission experts, cloud container expertise, and, um, and security expertise. So to my immediate left is Mr. Frank Bregulio from SailPoint. Uh, he's in the public sector for identity governance. Uh, he's the identity governance strategist uh, for, uh, works for uh, DOD CIO in, in some instances. He's a recognized thought leader and seasoned cybersecurity professional with more than 20 years of experience in identity, credentialing, and access management and he's got extensive knowledge of US government security and compliance standards. His hands-on experience in designing, implementing, and managing identity and security solutions are, are, are well known. So Frank, thank you for, for thank you. joining us. Next to Frank is Mr. Joe Carson. He also, he has more than 25 years of experience in enterprise security. Um, he's got several awards in InfoSec. He's authorized, uh, he's the author of Privilege Access Management for Dummies and Cybersecurity for Dummies. He's an active member of the cybersecurity. He speaks at, glo at conferences globally, and uh, he's uh, well-versed in critical infrastructure, financial, and maritime industries. So, Joe, thank you. Thank you. And then um, we also have uh, Mr. Don Macker. Uh, he serves as the technical director for research innovations. He's responsible for a number of important efforts in the DOD, employs cloud, containers, big data, and machine learning capabilities in support of the, inf of the command and control information environment and multi-domain operations, uh, applying uh, practices and agile developments, uh, agile DevSecOps. Um, he has more than 20 years of experience as a veteran and a subject matter expert. He's focused on joint and coalition integration of C4ISR systems and supports cyberspace targeting and fires using the DevSecOps approach to solve mission partner integration strategies. Thank you, Don. For and then Mr. Derek Strasberg from Microsoft is the Chief Technical Officer for Microsoft's national security business. He's responsible for defining and implementing the technical sales product strategy for the DOD's adoption of Microsoft Azure cloud technologies. He's got over 20 years of federal and commercial industry experience and a variety of technical and program and project management roles, including consulting, full life cycle software development, and operations with a focus on open source technologies. So, uh, Derek, thank you. Appreciate you joining us. So, uh, please, please welcome our panelists. Appreciate it. Okay. Hey, I'd like to start, you know, with with uh, okay from an industry perspective, uh, how we got into uh, zero trust, where that came from, and how that applies to uh, the cutting edge commercial technologies as well as how it could to containerize or cloud technologies that we can use in the, the DOD. So, Joe, you want to give us an intro? Sure, absolutely. I think what's really important is we have to understand how we got here. That's one of the important aspects. We never forget, you know, how we actually started coming around the term zero trust, where it came from and originated from. And it really goes back into, you know, around the late 2000s, we had machines that were actually getting infected with viruses. 
And one of the things that we did back in around the you know, late 2000s was quarantining those systems. So systems were quarantined into network segmentations, into VLANs, so they're actually isolated from the production and corporate networks until they were actually remediated and the security controls and the configurations re reset back and those malware or infections or viruses were removed. And that was really kind of where it began is network segmentation and around quarantining of systems. And then what happened was around the same time, we started seeing an influx of BYOD uh, adoption. Organizations started actually adopting people bringing in their own devices, purchasing their own devices, and accessing them to the corporate network. So those quarantine systems started being adopted and repurposed for the element of actually BYOD as well. So network segmentation or micro-segmentation became really the foundation of zero trust networks. And then it evolved around 2010, Forrester then came out, came out with a term and called it um, that it was a zero trust framework. And that's what we've kind of been adopting ever since. We've been looking at these areas where we don't have control of the devices, specifically around things, uh, IoT technologies, uh, BYOD scenarios, partnerships, cooperation, interoperability, coalitions, where we have no control over the end devices, but we actually have to do some type of security aspect. And that's where really zero trust, the foundation started. Now, where we are today is that in the more recent years, we started seeing it becoming more adapted and that we started actually we start with zero trust and we actually start building trust frameworks and models. And this is where we started seeing recently, of course, Gartner coming out with the Carta model, which is around adaptive risk. So what we're seeing is zero trust becoming a foundation into really about creating interoperability and creating frameworks based on risk uh, assessments and risk metrics in order to make sure that we only give access to the systems, the people, machines that need to have access. So it's really important to understand where we came from and how we got to. But the big question here is that where we're going, is where's the direction, how we can evolve that, and how can we take that to the next level where it really makes much more resilient and much more dynamic environments that we can actually operate without having uh, consistent uh, you know, cyber threats and attacks going on that we actually make them more protected, more um, authenticated, and more uh, integrity. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Don, can you uh, go over some of the uh, beneficial aspects of con containerized technologies and, and how that is evolving and how that potentially can be um, protected through zero trust or any other methodology? Sure, I'd be glad to talk to that point there. And maybe one thing I'd ask the audience to think about, if you're familiar with the container and technologies, it may be something to question. Mr. C. Slack is an authorizing official, has to assume the risk for the particular command. And if you're aware of some of the container technologies, and I'll go ahead and you've heard some of the comments and Admiral Richardson saying about being able to share data, implementing zero trust, is if you're an authorizing official, and let's say you gotta bring in a bunch of cyber data, you can uh, label that feature data for your machine learning models in an automated manner. Well, sir, I need to spin up approximately 240 containers. I'm gonna establish a new network. This network's gonna exist for about seven minutes, so that's not gonna be written down in some ports, protocols, and services documentation. It's not going to have all the IPs and the MAC address. Your job's gonna complete, and those two nodes with the pods they run into the containers go away in seven minutes. So think a little bit about that, how an authorizing official might be able to answer that question. And tying in the piece of zero trust, throughout my career I've worked with mission partners in different exercise, combat environments, stuff just as recently as uh, Cyber Blitz out at Fort Dix this year with the United States Army. And uh, Joe talked a bit about zero trust. So you got to look at how do I trust the person how do I trust the non-person, that service or capability that's communicating with me? As well as the location, where is that mission partner located? Which network are they coming to me from? And have not only the United States, but our mission partners adapted our applications and services to run in a cloud or a container environment. Am I still trying to deploy a full stack on a physical machine or in a virtual machine? Or do I just have that critical service, or if you've heard the industry term, microservices that comes up pulls its configuration from a known service, establish its connection to the data source, my mission partners and such like that, completes that role and then goes away until the next task or requirement comes from. That way you don't have any kind of persistent access. You know with a zero trust approach what service is coming in. Hey, my mission partner is sending my position location information or in the case of targets, they're sending me target data. And I trust that person, that service, and that location sending my location. I'm able to process the data, accomplish the mission, 
But at that time, that service goes away until I need it again. And then the automated configuration in the cloud environment and cloud-ready applications reestablishes that service again in a new container, accomplishes the mission, and goes away. So one thing it asked maybe two to think about and uh, the other counterparts in the panel are gonna talk about is how do I collectively establish trust across the different mission partners that include the United States for both the person, the service or the non-person entity, the location, the capability? How do I honor the policies and agreements between the different nations and partners in implementing that trust? And where do I host that, that everybody trusts where those applications and services are working to deliver to effect, accomplish the mission, whether I'm in a humanitarian uh, assistance or disaster relief, I'm in a competition phase that Admiral Richardson just spoke to, or I'm in combat operations or in conflict phase in a new terminology. So with that, I'll uh, turn that back yeah. to you, sir. Yeah, Admiral Davidson. So the, the components of zero trust, uh, from, from my understanding, are uh, first uh, understand the, the policies that you need to implement, then have control over the identities, both personnel and non-person identities, to have firm control of that. Uh, ruthless configuration management, uh, track your devices, um, uh, configurations and networks, and then be able to audit and monitor uh, everything that's going on. And that's a, that's a huge task. And um, you know, being able to do it both, both a, a, a cloud or your own uh, standard system requires a major transformation. So I'd like to turn it over to uh, Derek, Mr. Strasberg. Um, they're, they're fairly new, and are there any common myths that are worth dispelling that have come from early adopters, uh, and, and what kind of insights can you provide? Uh, no, that's a, that's a great question. Thanks, sir. Um, I think the um, probably the most prominent one that we hear all the time is it's a rip and replace. Our network is bad. Um, that's simply not the case. I mean, zero trust is not intended to be a rip and replace, go off and do this all over again. I mean, you can add segmentation to existing networks, and in fact, suffice to say, probably most of the network operators that I know out there are trying to do that even uh, today. Um, I think the second one is that zero trust has to be expensive. You have most of these tools already. Uh, if you don't, um, there's a myriad of them out there. Um, they just need to be used with a zero trust culture and methodology and approach in mind. Um, I think the other is uh, going back to Joe's earlier point, which is um, that it's all about the endpoint. That's another big, big myth. If I can control and harden this thing, then it's as trustworthy as it could possibly be. It's not about that because that endpoint is always going to change and always uh, going to be the first vector of attack. And then the fourth, which is interesting to the cloud guy up here, if you will, is that I can't do zero trust in cloud because I can't control it as well as I can control this thing that I have here, you know, sitting on the data center floor. It's actually completely false <laughs> in that it just provides, I think, a greater opportunity to do it because this is the impetus for, let's take a fresh look at how we can implement these things at a much greater scale using a significant, um, significantly enhanced degree of, mod of uh, automation um, and frankly resources in order to create almost sort of a digital twin of the enterprise, if you will, so you don't have to have that, all right, I'm all in, I'm diving off the diving board approach. You can actually go incrementally um, as opposed to an on-premise environment, which may not be as resilient and tolerant of implementing some of these approaches without some significant investment or downtime. So I think those are probably the big four. Um, one or more of them is present in just about every zero trust initiative I see at one point or another. Um, but uh, and, and certainly, in fact, even in the um, Microsoft kind of journey towards, towards zero trust, we've had our missteps along the way as well. I have something to, to that as well. I think another big area that I've experienced uh, in uh, organizations' adoption of, of zero trust frameworks and models is the concept that uh, they've been looking to different authentication mechanisms, and they've been adopting things like multi-factor authentication and also going down the term of biometrics and also passwords authentication. And one of the things that I, I kind of always warn is that 
as you move to using biometrics or passwords authentication, what you have to remember is that those are not replacing passwords and they're not replacing right. uh, authentication. They're actually providing identifiers, and that's the big myth as well that you find it's just in the one industry. Context, right? It's one context yep. of, of uh, the identifier of who or what is accessing your environment. So really, when you think about biometrics, they don't replace passwords. What they do is replace username. Yep. And this is a big misconception. A lot of organizations make the mistake that when they put in um, biometrics, they think they're replacing password. But in fact, what they're doing is they're eliminating password and only using username for authentication, which is a bad security practice. <laughs> so you have to remember that biometrics are not secrets. They are, they're visible. They're identifiers. And it's always important when you think about zero trust, if to really get to a zero trust framework, you have to augment biometrics with additional security controls. Mm -hmm. yep. And if I may... Sorry if I made one, one point, sir. There's Derek hit a really key point that I just wanted to make about cloud, and he talked about automation. Automation as part of getting your capabilities and services into a cloud environment to apply both the security controls, consistent configuration across environments and such, whether you're using your puppet, Ansible, Chef, pick your poison, is that is a one key thing that has to come with your cloud-enabled uh, application or service to apply the security, the configuration, and provide a consistent deployment, whether you're in development, test, mm -hmm. or production. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> so speaking of uh, identity authorization and, and assertion, I call, I call what you just said, Joe, is how do you assert your identity to which uh, a system could then use for authentication. So, so Frank, um, it, in a zero trust model or any model, what, uh, what insights have you gained and, and provided with regard to how a user asserts and authenticates their identity, and how can it be used in zero trust or in, in any, uh, any model? Sure. And, and when we talk about zero trust, what we're really talking about is the network perimeter is, is fallen, right? So it makes the, the importance of the identity more um, strategic than ever. Um, so we have to start with the foundational how we're creating the identity profile and the trust of how we're bringing that person into the environment. One of the biggest problems I see with, with the zero trust model is we start to transition from a, we're making authentication look like authorization, and that can be very challenging. We want to gain access and grant access fast, efficient for the warfighter, but we still have to step back and, and ensure that once we're allowing that person through the door, regardless of the authenticator, whether it's a, a CAT card, whether it's biometrics, a password, that really doesn't matter. Um, whether the device is compliant, what are we allowing that to do once they're inside the network? So when we have these federated protocols where we're doing authentication and we're sending attributes as part of the payload and granting access that way, it's, there still needs to be an identity governance foundation. And whether that is um, you know, looking at am I suitable for access, you know, today we look at suitability in DOD with a paper form, the, the special account access request, that really is just attributes about me and what I should or could access. Um, but it's not something that we look at frequently. So things about me change. My access should change. And when we're using access policies, um, you know, to drive the access controls for efficiency, Things may change about me. I'm no longer part of the co coalition. Um, my country's no part, no longer part of this. So no matter what attributes we're looking at um, in using those access policies, we need to ensure that we're looking at the identity um, from from really the entire life cycle as we onboard a coalition partner to when we remove that coalition partner, um, whether we're destroying the network or not, because we might be reusing that container or those access rights in another coalition. Um, so, so, Frank, um, speaking of our, our coalition partners, we have, you know, obviously 30-some um, nations, 36-nation uh, and PACOM, not all of them are partners, of course, but uh, some of them are of various degrees of technical maturity. How do we create a identity management, identity credentialing and uh, management system uh, that involves different coalition partners so that they can all be brought into the same coalition? Sure, M much like we would talk about establishing trust at the authentication um, layer with 
um, with federation, we need to start, I think, with an attribute sharing, data sharing policy as well, where um, we're working with our, our, our coalition partners um, to establish who we're letting through the door. What are the boundaries of who gets access? Um, we do that through a number of identity technologies, through virtual directories, connectivity, connectors, all these different types of things, to build that profile of who has access. We use that data then with the policies established on top of it, whether it's privileged policies, DevOps, um, and, and that gives us the platform and visibility then across the application portfolio um, to see who has access to what, how they got it, and are they suitable, do they re remain suitable for that access. Do we, um, do we have one master database that we manage from the United States, or do we, how, do we, how do we work with um, the actual countries themselves to actually manage their own uh, data, uh, their own identity data? I think that's going to be a combination of our own sources that we would source through DMDC, in region, JPASS, things that you know have all of the attribute data um, that make up the profile, billet code, things like that, um, requirements to the system, and then expect some level of that from our from our coalition partners into that service. Um, we can also do, as we talked about, the, the federated authentication, load up the authentication profiles, assert the attributes via that trust, but then also before we grant access and freedom within our, within our environment, there's some form of, of governance policy or process um, hmm. as well. Joe, and, um, you, you've got international experience and, and I think uh, work with companies that have uh, are, are required to provide authorization across international boundaries. What, what's your thoughts on that? Absolutely, and one, one of the kind of going on, on Frank's uh, point yeah. as well, and that's a great uh, segue into this, is that it's really important that you have to understand that when you're looking at, uh, you know, whether you do a single correlated uh, data lake or you have multiple, a lot of what determines um, a bilateral in countries is a li the legal framework that aligns to that is you always have to make sure that law allows and permits you to store certain types of data in other locations as well. So one of the things Absolutely. that in international working in, in Europe, and specifically around regulations like GDPR, you have to adhere to certain regulations to make sure that the rule of law applies first, and then what we do is make it possible after that. Um, being based in Estonia and working in Estonia digital identity and seeing that identity became the foundation of the entire country, one of the things that was important that as you work with uh, multiple countries, one of the things you have to make sure is that you can make the audit log, the access log available so they can self-audit what you're actually accessing in their environment. They may not have the identity or the, the who, but they know when and uh, an identifier or pointer that access that information, but you don't necessarily reveal the, actually, uh, the identity itself until they may request some type of verification or after effect uh, reveal they want to know a, a full disclosure of those types of incidents. But it's really important that when you work with multiple countries that you have to make sure that one is a binding agreements and also you have to make sure that you have a common attribute sharing uh, to what Frank mentioned is that you have to have that common framework, a common attributes that actually align and map to each other. Um, and it comes down to is that countries can bring their own identity uh, but the target must provide the authorization. And this is where you have that separation um, in access. Mm -hmm. So privilege access is what really enables those through policies, so is that countries can then determine their privilege access policies. So being in the past, many long time ago when I didn't have gray hair, um, I was a domain administrator for about 100,000 servers. And that was across multiple organizations. And I have one domain administrator that could access all of those across all companies. No matter what cage and what locks and what data center are in, I had a domain admin and a VPN access that could give me access to everything because I was the guy who fixed everything. And when anything went wrong, they called me and I fixed it because I had the credential that did that. I realized that that methodology was wrong. And I actually know I have a, a methodology that no one has domain administrator access. Everyone has standard least privilege, the principle of least privilege. And what you do is you gain the access. You prove yourself to get that access. And that's where really privilege access management helps that. It makes sure you have that segregation, separation of duties, is that I may have access to identify myself, but when I want to access specific data or data vault or attributes or information across multiple locations, I have to make sure that I've got the authorization to do that. 
and each of those targets may maintain those authorizations. So this is where it's really important about privilege access and separation of duties and the separation, and one of my methodologies as well is not only going to a non-domain type of methodology, which is, still, which is a concept of zero trust. One of my main areas is that also data should never move. And data should remain um, in its location of origin. And uh, this is one of the concepts, again, uh, based in Estonia, is that we have uh, decentralized the data, which increases resilience. If you have no central data repository, then they have to target multiple data lakes in order to gain access, in order to get the context. So decentralizing data as well is a way to maintain resilience. And it also means that authorization can be maintained over those different uh, uh, repositories as well for uh, longer periods and better integrity. So if data if data never moves, how do you how do you distribute it and get it to different locations to uh, achieve the resiliency that you just uh, That's a mentioned? fantastic question. Um, mm -hmm. It's all about asking the right questions. You don't collect data for the sake of collecting data. You collect data for the sake of uh, solving problems, uh, answering questions, um, giving you information that can make decisions. So it's all about it. if I need a specific set of data, I need to know what question I'm asking. And one of the ideas, at least in the European Union going forward, is that data will become the fifth pillar of the EU eventually over time. And that means if I go to, for example, rent a car in Germany, the car rental company doesn't need to know my color of my eyes, my height, my date of birth, my home address. What the car rental company needs to know is that am I legal to drive? And that's the question that they want to ask. And what I do is I provide them where that data exists. They can ask that data source the question. And then if they want to have additional level of trust or authorization, then I can point to a trusted source saying, these are the different trusted source, whether it being a government, whether it being a bank, whether it being some type of agency, you can say they can trust and verify that that data is accurate. Um, therefore, they know that I'm legal to drive. So it's all about asking the right questions and knowing how to gain access to where that data or metadata exists. Well, and, and it's just in time. Just in time, correct. And you may have data. escrows. Um, if data is coming from different locations or sources, you may have using things like containers mm -hmm. and uh, disposable networks or disposable compute locations, they may be used to do the aggregation of multiple data uh, locations, which is similar to what EU lease is doing in Europe when it comes to, for example, API and uh, Visa Schengen areas. They're creating those on-demand real-time uh, information uh, in order to make a decision, and then that data disappears uh, once it's no longer used. Mm -hmm. It means that any adversary, any attacker, will never have understanding about the algorithm or the multiple data sources. What they might do is they might have the result. And what they can do with the result, yes, I'm legal to drive, doesn't give them any contextual use um, other than I'm legal to drive. Right. So that's where you want to get into the concept of data not moving and creating uh, just-in-time um, data correlation aggregation to help you make the right decisions based on the right questions. Mm -hmm. Don, um, kind of an expert on containerized cloud technologies. We have large programs such as Global Command and Control System, uh, Jade Ox Joint uh, Employable Operations Control System. Um, and and with, with large life cycles, um, what's, what would you say is the best approach to taking those systems and containerizing them or don't, don't even bother just go to the next generation and, and, and rebuild them from scratch. Yeah. And in full disclosure, I used to help work on JDOX, the Joint Automated Deep Operation Course of Build. Yeah. One thing I think you, you got to have to do to get things into containers is understand the, op uh, the operational use case of the application or service you're deploying, what is the architecture of the application services, and what can you reuse from the enterprise? Because if you look at a lot of these, um, I'll just use the term stovepipe generically, whether it's the global command and control system, it's JDOX, it's TACE, it's AMDUS, go down the list of these different air defense, airspace control systems. They're monolithic applications. They bring in every capability that they need, whether they're doing the map for geospatial services, interfaces to US and coalition partner capabilities and their computation. And it's basically breaking that down into a microservices architecture in a container environment, having a standard set of services that, for example, if I have to talk to a mission partner, I'm receiving an air tasking order from another mission partner's airspace, uh, air tasking system, I'm receiving an airspace control or order from a mission partner, a target from a mission partner that service handles a specific request. I'm not deploying an entire monolithic system. And 
as I look at my DevSecOps approach, can I reuse these components? And basically, even though composing applications is kind of a you know, bygone term, I'm taking the message processor, I'm taking the geospatial render, I'm getting this thing on a map, and I'm using standards, whether it's my JavaScript object notation, my HTML5 capabilities, to present that context versus having proprietary or localized data models to get that content. And lastly, is as you look at microservices architecture, they're hinged on what's called asynchronous services, or in the case of, you probably heard as REST services. So I'm making a call, I get my piece of content, as Joe talked about, I'm not getting the keys to the castle, I receive the things I need, my services aggregate that and present it to the user. And the other key component is built, decomposing these legacy applications and services, but building in security from the ground floor. Looking at, as I select my components, my supply chain, how I'm gonna to authenticate to those services and building a microservices architecture where I can get the maximum reuse. And sometimes it doesn't fit corporate business models, but it gives the warfighter the capability and the need to execute the mission. So Derek, you, you went and dispelled some of these, the myths of zero trust, um, and maybe I'm asking the same question in a different direction, but we have um, coalition partners who have their own applications, um, then we have those who wanna use our applications and then and then we do have the legacy infrastructure that, that exists today. What's the, the first step we should take in, in, in transitioning ourselves from, from a, a, a legacy standard application set into a more popular set and being uh, applying zero trust? What, what's kind of the first step that, that we would take? We'll open it and get some of the other partners on the panel here. One thing I think is, as Joe and some of the other speakers alluded to, is agreeing on a policy and approach. If we look at how the internet currently works, we agree on how a PKI certificate works. So when you go to your website and see HTTPS, that certificate's a standard. How that transport layer security works, how I move data around. So getting the mission partners together and agreeing on a standards of how I build, deploy, and secure applications while considering the national equities of cybersecurity, data protection, and such like that. And once you've agreed to that and saying, hey, I'm gonna exchange data via REST services like this, I'm gonna secure my services in this particular way, I am going to apply this safe hybrid set of security controls that meet the national interests of the US and their mission partners, is getting that agreement up front before you spend a dollar on trying to build something. Because if you don't, otherwise it's going to partition itself down into a set of national and potentially corporate equities, and then you're not gonna get the desired result to be able to execute operations in the competition or the conflict phase. Yeah, just, to, just to add to that, I think one of the things that I find is that uh, when, when you're doing this transformation, whether it being to, to cloud or, or uh, technologies or, or interoperability or, or you know, new innovations, and one of the things that I find is that you know we take this path and we, we discuss around IoT adoption as well and, and 5G networks and everything else. It's really important that you take it as an aspect of everything I look at um, is always from a risk approach. At the end of the day, when we talk about cyber resilience or cyber uh, uh, risks, it's all about reducing the risk as much as you possibly can. Either eliminate it completely or reducing it, making it as difficult as possible for the attacker to gain access. So when we're going down this, it's always about understanding uh, from a risk assessment and a risk framework. Those models will help you determine where you need to apply zero risk first. Where's the priority? Where's the highest risk areas? Where's the ones that I cannot reduce through traditional means that I need to take in a, a, a zero risk or zero trust approach? So it really starts with that risk framework model and having that and then prioritizing it from what is my highest risk assets and starting with those first and then working your way down. Uh, because then what you're looking is when we talked about policies earlier, is saying that whether I'm protecting let's say, a weapon system, then I want to make sure that that has the most highest security controls as possible versus satellite images versus uh, some type of uh, weather patterns. You have different types of classifications or different types of controls that you need to satisfy to access each of those. And that's where you get into the zero trust is what's my most, what's my highest controls that I need to satisfy? Is it you know, multiple people that need to verify that to give you the access? Is it a multiple key approach? Or is it simply just a password? Or is it even you know, just a username like a biometric. So getting into that, the risk and what's satisfying those controls and reducing the risk should be one of the you know, kind of the beginnings um, of how you determine where you start with zero trust in and where's the priority as well. Hmm. 
Yeah, I, I, just to kind of build on that too, I think one of the things that gets missed a lot of times with any zero trust conversation is we're not doing zero trust for fun. We're doing mm -hmm. zero trust because it's about the data yeah. ultimately. Like a device can be compromised, a network can be compromised, a user or a group of users can certainly be compromised. It's really about protecting uh, the data underneath the covers. And I think a lot of times what gets missed, uh, particularly in these uh, information sharing environments is we need to agree on a set of primitives for actually marking the data because one of the most important pieces of context aware zero trust is what data am I trying to access? All those other things yeah. aside, user, device, where I came from, is my container secure and do I have secure infrastructure abstracted away underneath that? It's really all about what pieces of data am I trying to access given all this other context. Mm -hmm. Data marking sounds like a really boring exercise. It is. Hard. It's really hard. It's, it's but hard. bottom line is at least establishing a very, very discrete set of data marking primitives is incredibly important to in making this happen. Yeah, I, 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 I did a lot of data loss prevention and <laughs> uh, those types of controls in the past, and I struggled with data classification. Yep. Um, I got to the point where, because of some of the organizations I work with, just the, might, the size of data was so huge, it was impossible. It, because it changed, and not only was it not just text-based or you know, things you can go off market, but it's also imagery, and it was also algorithms, yep. it was pharmaceutical you know, prescriptions, um, where you'll have to look at it, well, well I can't, what can I go off from a data loss? And what I found was the easy approach, the beginning, um, I marked applications, classified applications that had access to data right. um, that was classified as sensitive. And it made it much easier saying that this application, it meant that I could reduce the num number of data points and number of data attributes down mm -hmm. to saying that only a few thousand applications I needed to classify rather than petabytes and petabytes, petabytes of, data, of data. Exactly. Um, so if you're looking at an easy approach, I would suggest start with the applications and then work your way down to, to more sensitive types of data attributes. It's a much easier uh, feat. You know, that seems to be the, the biggest challenge that we have and the reason why we have separate information infrastructures is, is because of classification. You know, a, a, a secret uh, document releasable to one country may not be uh, releasable to a, a different country. And as such, you have to apply national strategic mm -hmm you know, strongest national strategic protections on those two uh, elements or, or on those two uh, bodies of information. So um, I guess uh, one of the things we've been struggling with, and you heard Admiral Davidson talk about a data-centric approach, and I'll turn this over to Mr. Strasberg. Um, is it possible for us to have data uh, in a single database or single information base or a single data lake, if you will, that is of different classification levels maintained at a strength of separation that is, meets national security levels, number one. And then number two, while I'm thinking of it, to, to everyone, would, a, would an international marking strategy uh, labeling a service, not just a strategy, but a labeling service be useful in, in, in achieving multinational uh, coalition clouds? It is certainly possible. I don't know how practical it is. The tech is there. But the practicality is we're never going to get, nor would we want to put all of our data in one yeah. uh, proverbial basket, so to speak. Um, I think data virtualization is a pretty well established concept at this point. Micro segmentation in terms of uh, uh, services for data access, as we discussed a little bit earlier, is really the way to go for building a data sharing or data collaboration type of environment rather than necessitating some big monolithic uh, data lake or what inevitably would turn into a data swamp uh, long term. <laughs> yeah, you, lose, you lose veracity. The more data you have, the veracity decreases. It goes, goes down exponentially over time, absolutely. Well, how do you achieve uh, artificial intelligence, uh, being able to access all the different information sources in order to pull together uh, information, uh, decision, you know, decisionable information, which is knowledge, et cetera? How, how do you achieve that? Uh, there, there's there's a number of different means to reach sort of a, a trusted data marketplace for building <laughs> machine learning mm -hmm. algorithms um, in much the same approach we've been talking about before with, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a data sharing fabric, yeah. if you will, or an interoperability at the uh, microservices level, mm -hmm. even to pull in data to create data models to 
test and train and over time uh, go through back through the uh, machine learning or uh, DevSecOps types of processes. In fact, I mean, just to talk about Microsoft for a second, we don't have a single repository for every discrete piece of data that we want to use uh, in the company for training uh, the algorithms uh, that we use to do everything from build product to run our business. Um, as a company, we are firmly aligned on the whole uh, idea of uh, data ponds mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and the ability to use those data ponds real time to create um, yeah. the, the data that's needed to, to um, yeah, and, and maybe a couple comments on the AI and the training sets and the models. One thing to think about, uh, earlier we talked about what is the question or what is the operational question in presenting the data. The majority of models right now that are done in more so machine learning than I would say AI or artificial intelligence are supervised models. Whether you're doing some of your more traditional models, you're doing neural nets, et cetera, there's very limited set of unsupervised learning models. So if you are bringing a training set of data together and you have to label those features so you can train your model and get the desired result is you're gonna have some segmentation there based on the type of question that you're answering based on the data that's available there. So that does give you that bit of a segmentation and control based on what you're using that particular machine learning model to do. And the other th reason to possibly do that is, you know, DARPA's put out some pretty interesting papers on counter machine learning, uh, information environment, there are some things you can try out there where things that you're getting presented in the consumer space through artificial intelligence have been manipulated by adversaries, so you're getting a different than expected message. So looking at how you get access to your, your training set, your verification set, how you label those features, and then how you train that model is pretty important. And I think, again, the trust thing, the access, and both U.S. and national interests play a role in it. Yeah, I just add to that as well. I, I just came from the Talent Digital Summit, which uh, this year in September was focused around uh, artificial intelligence uh, and government policy and acceptable use. And one of the things, I mean, there's a big discussion, and I always like to, you know, set the, I guess, everyone on the same page. I, I hate calling AI artificial intelligence. I, I have, you know, heard various terms from augmented intelligence to artifact intelligence, <laughs> if you're talking to academia, um, to automated intelligence. Um, I think I, I prefer the term machine intelligence because right. really what it is is about machines correlating and aggregating data um, at a faster rate that humans can. Um, so machine intelligence is the term I prefer to, to, to get into because it takes away the myth of, you know, you know, that what we see in the media and what we see in the news and it really focuses about what reality is. Um, but yes, absolutely, when, when we're looking at talking with uh, Derek had mentioned, it's really about coming down to the metadata and using machine learning will tell you where the data location is of how to get that data, uh, what it can be used for potentially, some, yeah. some type of description or tagging, um, and then bringing it together when you need to. Um, and that's where basically you know, machine learning, machine intelligence combined will allow you to make much faster decisions and augment your decision making much quicker. Um, that's where the advantage will come to, is being able to do that much faster. Than, and of course 5G contributes to that as well because yeah. One of the things I've seen, uh, specifically in Estonia, with 5G, is the benefit is that while it allows you faster data transfer, what I've been finding is the savings is actually on battery <laughs> and energy. Um, that's where I've been seeing the savings is around the actually energy cost of having to commute, compute at the edge where I can compute centrally and make the data available quicker. Um, but the energy um, has savings has been the, predominantly the, the most benefiting fact. Um, so those are things that I think that you know, quick data transfers um, the energy savings of process and using machine intelligence and machine learning to be able to know where that data um, can be located. And if not, you can then get the point was, I, I don't know where the data is, you can then ask the question into uh, coalition partners or mission partners into, well, do you know where I can get this data, but does anyone have the data? So you can also raise the flag and see if uh, uh, automation can happen. How, how do you do that? How do you, how do you keep a system where everyone in the coalition knows where the data they need is located. Is that uh, an uh, international tr system or is it a system that uh, one country runs or some federation? It's, it's, it's similar to no different from DNS. You don't have to know where it is, you just have to know someone who knows where it is. Ah. Uh, so what happens is it's simply just like a library index. You go to a library, 
you look for the index card. I'm, I guess old yeah. school. Most people probably used the Kindles and stuff. <laughs> when I went to the library, I started to go and find this index card where the book was on the shelf. Huh. Um, and that's how you, you, you find data. So having some type of pointer index system will allow you to eventually derive to, to the data location. Uh, and meta, meta cube data <laughs> yeah. service. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that's why the identity becomes so Correct. important is having the metadata used in the policies is essentially the same metadata that we need to know about the user. Correct. And having that as retrievable with the same kind of analytics looking at it becomes just as important as the data itself. Yeah. Frank, what's, is there a, just a more simple question that we've been asking, is, is there a, a single system or a best system that all allies and partners can use to have a high enough assurance of their identity. In other words, an assertion system, even you know, commercial or, or even open source, that we would say to some country, Indonesia, Philippines, <laughs> Thailand, uh, Korea, you know, I'm just you know, throwing out there, that use this system and then we will uh, trust that uh, your identity is properly asserted and then run it through some sort of uh, um, authentication mechanism. Wow, that's a loaded one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think I think each participant has to. We have to have trust rules, as we were talking about before, and and what makes up that trust. You know, in the U.S., I think it's very easy for us to establish that trust. Maybe Australia, New Zealand, as well, with some of their national ID programs. Some of these other countries, you know, that's going to be a that's going to be a tough one. So, you know, almost. It, taking, assuming trust from the source where we get the identity is a form of trust. Um, if, if we were to, you know, have some form of attribute service that was providing metadata about the people that we were trying to authenticate or authorize, um, just the source, the fact that we receive that from a, a certain entity can be, can be leveraged as trust. And that could be over a number of authentication authorization protocols. Um, all right. Adding to that, I think um, my, my vision as well, where I see this going down to is, is the economy of sharing, uh, is that uh, identity will be transferable between uh, different locations and different yep. companies and different organizations. So uh, people will bring their own identity. What the organizations will be responsible for is the authorization that that identity can have access to. Yep. Um, so you'll get into the economy of sharing, and therefore um, I will provide protocols and standards that allows that identity to be consumed. Um, but what my organization that would be responsible for is authorizing the policies of what that identity can be used for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this means that such for, for coalition partners that they can bring their own identity, what's the important aspect of making interoperability is the access and authorization that they can actually uh, incorporate into. Hmm. Yep. So authorization, I mean, um, assertion belongs to the user, users, the Authentication belongs to sort of the enterprise that needs to use it, yeah. and the authorization belongs to the service who wants to grant. Correct. Absolutely, that's exactly. Okay, so we've been talking around here about you know what I could consider at the operational uh, level of how to how to bring coalitions, how to bring various users, and not just not just users, people, but but non-person as well, identifying uh, the devices that can be used. I uh, assume using the same techniques that we've we've been talking about. So trying to kind of trying to scratch the itch of, of, of how do we you know achieve this high speed using rapid development uh, DevSecOps in in a, a multi coalition area is is focused in the operational level and um, as you can see it's a pretty tough problem and it requires some structure and maybe some some structure that everyone can use in forms of standards, agreements, policies. And it uh, just doesn't seem we're, like we're, we're very well structured to even achieve that. <laughs> but uh, at least got some ide uh, ideas on how to proceed. So with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and open the uh, floor up to any questions that, uh, that you may have. Thank you, sir. First one should be up on the screen in front of you. It's a long multi-part. It's encouraging that there are some great innovative solutions that embrace the zero trust approach. When is DOD going to walk away from ponderous DAA bureaucracies and inflexible hardware solutions to invest in these technologies? Are we making measurable progress? And if so, which nations are the farthest down the road in those efforts? Yeah, um, I fully understand, appreciate, <laughs> and identify with uh, the, the question. Um, 
and when is DOD going to walk away? I think we're starting to get to the point where we realize that uh, that maybe this the DAA bureaucracy, there's the risk management framework with the authorizing official. There's a really, you know, the risk management framework is a very uh, detailed, well-written document. The trouble is, and there is even a document that tells how to apply the risk management framework. The trouble is, in risk management framework, there's 18 families of controls that's in alphabetical order and doesn't really uh, divide into what belongs to the organization, what belongs into, to the system, what belongs to policies. And uh, as such, it's a pretty crushing implementation. I think that what, what we'll do is, uh, the, the controls are good. It's a matter of decomposing those controls and, um, and applying those to what we're talking about here, figuring out is it the system, is it the organization, is it the enterprise? And, and then uh, applying uh, as such. Um, are we, so at this point, I would say that, yeah, when is it? I, I think next year. <laughs> next year, <laughs> next year the, the DOD uh, uh, Chief Information Security Officer will figure this out, uh, if, if I have anything to do with it, and uh, because I have some problems in PACOM to do that, and then be able to apply the measures as they are, are going to, either by the system, by the organization, or a specific system. Measurable mm -hmm. progress, no, because we haven't even started. Nations farthest down the road, you know, I'll tell you, I think the, the United States, uh, there may be nations who have their own, I mean, there are, their own security apparatus, but we in the United States have been looking at this. So, so we've got it kind of covered exhaustively, but from a, imp, from a practical implementation standpoint, uh, we have to recognize we have to take the next mm. next step and make yeah. it, it make it um, practical uh, so that security is in place, not just complying with, with a bunch of uh, rules. Anyone? Yeah, I'd, I'd still add to it. I mean, you know, it, it's no different from industry as well. I, I've been in industry my entire career, mm -hmm. and we have the same challenges. And how we approach it is, is that we have to have some type of value that we're adding as a result of what we're doing. Uh, we won't be able to get budget and spend and make changes and make innovation without having a valuable business purpose for doing so. So it all comes down to when I'm making a decision or I'm looking at re-architecting or rolling out a new solution, there always has to be a value component. And that value component be derived from different things. It could be from risk reduction. Uh, it could be from avoiding serious fines from regulation uh, compliance failures. It could be about um, saving time. And one of the biggest areas that's uh, in Estonia, one, when we looked at, uh, we were trying to get a budget increase for our government information systems. Mm -hmm. And we looked at what was that information systems contributing to our overall savings of the country. And it was actually 67 days GDP per year. Mm -hmm. So if you can actually calculate it into some type of justifiable value, that's where basically this goes away. This, this, this disappears when you can actually justify value, time savings, life savings, that come as a result of what you're achieving, then this tends to accelerate much faster. Yep. Yep. And if I can just hit the point out, are we making measure of progress? Just real briefly, I'll point you to a couple things. If you Google some of the stuff that's being done with continuous ATO, ATO in a day, and also how authorizing officials are leveraging the automation and DevSecOps to go, okay, I trust you this far, and the difference is this application or service that you're injecting into the container that gives them a little bit more flexibility and there's some measurable progress. Yeah, and just to add one more thing, I, I think the whole notion that we're approaching this as a software-centric problem is a demonstrable sign of progress, <laughs> actually. The fact that all four of us work for software companies yeah. and that we're not up here talking about the latest gizmo that you can punch, you know, plug into this or that indicates that we are making some progress here. Um, the continuous ATO process, I think, is a, is, a, is a great indicator of that, frankly, and that we're looking at it as, hey, we can automate this stuff in software yes. and embrace a secure from the ground up approach yeah. rather than, uh, I gotta put this thing behind you know, seven <laughs> gates and then we call it secure. So yeah. I, for me, that's the most encouraging thing that I've seen in you know, 20 plus years of supporting the federal and DOD market. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the, um, yeah, you, but you still have to have policies in place to program yep. too. And so I totally agree. Automation, easy for you to say in the industry that well, you know it's a risk approach. <laughs> uh, but that, yeah, but but you're right. Um, 
just another thing on this, this uh, that I found useful is the cybersecurity maturity model mm -hmm. certification. That actually is a sequence of security functions with a grade with it, within each of those functions that you can achieve. Understanding that you know it, you can't be a hundred. Well, if you had all the resources in the world, you can um, you know invest those and make yourself fully mature, uh, and that's good. But but you know risk management approach. You don't have those resources. So, you know it's better to apply resources to a benefit than the risk reduction, and you can get a grade in the secure, um, cybersecurity maturity model. So I think that's a really uh, good start, good approach to, to using that model mm -hmm. and casting the risk management framework into that model and giving a grade rather than choosing right. controls. Okay, next question. The biggest threat is still misconfigured or misunderstood processes or true insiders working to get data or so distrust in the data. How do we best build and maintain trust across coalition boundaries? I can, I can take, take that one, yeah. So it's, it's all about oversight. It's about transparency and, and uh, one is that, uh, so when I worked in data centers, um, one thing is I'd work in a cage for a specific month and then I'd transfer to another cage. And there's always somebody coming behind me auditing my work. So it's always about, one of the things is, is to prevent insiders is that what you try to do is, it's, it's impossible. There's always, I call, you know, when we talk about different threat actors, there's a suicidal insider who has basically all intentions but to disrupt and destroy. They don't have, they don't care of going to jail or, or, or whatever consequences that happens. So there's always those ones that you, you know, will always have to, to, to uh, just prepare for the readiness and response when it happens. Um, but in regards to preparation, what you do is you deter. You make it much more, people knowing that they're being monitored, people knowing that their work has been audited, what that does is basically um, it forces people to um, not abuse their authorization and access that they have. It means they will not cut corners because they know that their work has been audited, they know it's been monitored. I've had situations where, similar to when I worked in the, the data center cages, people would actually move behind me and they would go through it, verifying all the work that I just did the previous month. Um, and that meant that it prevented collusion. It also meant that there was actually, I was not taking any shortcuts or actually doing any misconfigurations or trying to bypass processes. Um, and also similar to, to um, other environments as well, where, for example, you end up getting into, um, I've had uh, in Germany databases where I've had the database administrator located in Poland. And German law says that that person can't look at the data. So what you end up doing is you monitor and record all their activity that they're using. And what happens is that forces a good behavior. It forces people to not abuse it. So what you're doing is you're eliminating majority of insiders who are not those who, who have intentional threats. Um, so what you're doing is reducing that risk significantly. And a quick comment. I think it's interesting that the person who asked the question basically said misconfigured and misunderstood processes. And uh, that caught my attention in the question. So my compliments to whoever wrote the question is that's where your automation and your DevSecOps approach does. And if you take uh, just to kind of use a euphemism, an open kimono approach, I can lay out my puppet, Ansible, chef, pick your poison on the config management tool code to say, hey, I'm going to drop this web server in here, in this case, say HTTP. I'm going to secure it in this particular method. I'm going to lay down my ports, protocols, and services in this house. I'm going to inject your app into that web server. I can sit there with the partner, look at that code, and completely understand how that app or service is getting built or laid down in that container. So that way, you can eliminate the question of misconfiguration, the misunderstood process, and then you and the coalition partner can look at that code base and understand exactly how that app or service is being installed, configured, and maintained, and serving and protecting mm -hmm. their data. Yeah. And, and, and that applies to the identity as well. Exactly. I, I, I yeah. mean, you know, as someone is lurking around the network, they're testing out controls that they may have acquired nefariously. Um, having automated response and automation with you know, SIM tools, um, UEBA, all these sensors with PAM, and then being able to automatically disable um, a user performing a nefarious action um, or even what might be construed as one um, mitigates a lot of this risk of, of, of misconfigured apps and, and misunderstood mm -hmm. processes. You know, I, I kind of throw a lot of those at our, at our manual processes that we use today to yeah. grant access. Automation. Um, right. You need yeah. that automation to, and that centralization. We were talking earlier about multiple different environments. Well, the identity, that's where, you know, the, that identity becomes that critical to see 
the centralized view of access that the identity has and apply risk to that. How risky of a user am I? What sensitive systems do I have access to in context of what action I just performed? Yep. Um, and, and, and that really builds that zero trust model. Correct, and it means you can actually say that I can either quarantine that user or was it uh, uh, reduce the privileges they had until they remediate or reduce that risk um, yep. from you know, either removing an application or security control or encryption from what they previously had. Until that risk is satisfied, then they will get the elevation or yep. privileges back again. Absolutely. I'll, I'll take the or path up here. Because um, <laughs> again, like my point earlier, this really is all about the data that we're, the whole reason we're all sitting here in the room and we're up here. Um, and I think this is, gets back to an earlier point that was made is, it's great to monitor the network, great to monitor the identity, great to do everything else. We also have to have continuous monitoring over the data uh, and the data assets right. that we're building based on the data. So we talked about AI a little bit and counter, uh, counter machine learning, counter, counter mm -hmm. AI earlier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's one of the foremost necessities in order to actually build and pr protect against counter AI is to actually have a sense of data custody. Yeah. Who's touched it? When they touched it, what did they do? What, what model is this actually executing right now? Has the model drifted over time? Was the model drift intentional? Was it unintentional? If so, what imparted those changes? So I mean, there's a, there's a big piece of this that's all about the telemetry as it relates to the data as well. Okay, I guess one, one more question. So at the start of the panel, Mr. C mentioned a few challenges. Um, does the panel members see any utility in AI or ML solutions for those challenges that he mentioned? It's the only way to do this at scale. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely. If you look at, you know, speaking from the identity space, we're building a lot of um, technologies around AI and ML to look at access history to help make the end uh, user make recommendations for access, get to that process where we're using AI and ML for autonomous access, yep. um, building peer group analysis for outliers. Um, so m at all levels of, of the zero trust architecture, I think there's, there's you know, valid use for, for AI and ML. Yeah, and I would definitely agree. And if you look at some of the attributes the speakers on the panel and Mr. C. Slack alluded to here, when we look at zero trust, I'm trying to assure the person, the non-person entity, device, location. Uh, one thing I'd recommend if you have a bit of time, Google, uh, Google uh, Beyond Corporate. It's a pretty interesting zero trust model. It's just good from an educational point. They put a lot of things into the thing. But if you look at those attributes, and I'm monitoring my environment, I've got my logging, I understand where the folks are coming in from, et cetera. You could then train models to look at that and go, hey, is the person who is asking the data, are they going at the level of privilege? Your models can then, machine learning more so than AI, identify anomalies and patterns and stuff that don't fit what is an expected access for that user. Say, for example, if you're looking at a, a target to your accessing a target database, it's coalition shared. Are the users coming in or from the targeting shop have a need to know that information? And you can train your models to look at for anomalies in those access patterns and exfiltration of that data. Yeah. I think if you look at the um, Zero Trust white paper that the DIB, uh, Defense Innovation Board, published, one, yeah. one of the foremost, you gotta have this to do this, is actually machine learning capability. Because mm -hmm. again, there's not enough people in the uh, DOD yeah. to sit there and monitor all the context that's required to implement zero trust throughout the department. Yeah, yeah I mean, Forrester called it out 10 years ago when they, yeah. when, when they originally published the zero trust model. AI and ML was a big part of it. Cool. All right, well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to me that we have, uh, you know, there's major ecosystems, you know, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, and, and they can, develop zero trust within those ecosystems, digital ecosystems, it seems to me that, that if we can develop a uh, d Department of Defense ecosystem that would be able to implement that and have a service that all can use to do it consistently, applying AI ML would be, uh, you know, it's nirvana, I guess, but I think something we need to achieve, otherwise we'll be continuing to develop independent systems. Well, I want to thank my panel, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, 
Mr. Strasburg, Mr. Macker, to uh, Mr. Carson and Mr. Bergoglio. Uh, uh, great insights. Um, I, I hopefully got some ideas, and I, got, I certainly did, and really appreciate your time and, and your insight. So please uh, help me thank my panel. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. And thank you for hanging in there with us. Uh, you know, you didn't lose, you know, even the folks in the, in the balcony back there who have easy access stuck around. But I <laughs> do appreciate it. Have a great rest of the conference, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. thank you.